Welcome to the Special Operations Medical Association podcast series on prolonged field care. Any opinions contained in these podcasts are those of the authors alone and do not reflect U.S. Army, DOD, or U.S. government opinion or policy. Hey everyone, I'm Paul from the Prolonged Field Care Working Group. Up until now, I've been running ProlongedFieldCare.org from behind the scenes with the occasional blog post when I get a chance. Justin's been buried with work lately, so I'm going to attempt to fill his big shoes and begin preparing everyone for our SAMHSA program with this show. We have a great episode lined up with EM Crit's own Scott Weingart, which will serve as the first part of our Flip Classroom pre-conference lab discussion. So let's get to the interview. Okay, for everyone listening, if you have not already listened to Ruben Strayer's Smack Chicago Conference podcast, there's going to be a link in the show notes at prolongedfieldcare.org. Please go listen to that first and then come back and listen to this because we'll be referring to it throughout the podcast and it's Scott's homework to you. So go listen to that, come back here and listen to this. For those of you in our audience who are new to podcasts, EM Crit and Scott Weingart, uh, Scott, can you quickly tell everyone a little bit about who you are, your philosophy? You've developed with MCRIT and how you got started changing medical education with your brand of FOMED. Uh, so sure, uh, I, I did emergency medicine and then did a couple of fellowships in surgical critical care and trauma. And the podcast was started with the philosophy that there's a lot of pontificating about the theory of taking care of really sick patients, but I wanted a outlet where I could talk about the logistics of it, how to actually get it done at the bedside, or in the case of you folks in the field, not just on a theoretical level, but an actual like sticking your hands on the equipment and on the patients and making things happen. And I hadn't found an, a source for that, so I figured I'd do it myself. Oh yeah, I agree. And uh, now we're taking it down to our little micro niche here in the, uh, in the field world out here in military medicine. Um, so I'm not sure how many people involved with our prolonged field care movement are really aware of the impact you've had on our recommendations and the methods we use to get our word out. And maybe you don't either, but your post innovation checklist was directly adapted to my uh, post cry care checklist that I put up. And you're in- instrumental in advising us in using Libsyn and influencing me to use Word- WordPress for our blog. Thanks for catching us up to the times and enabling us to more efficiently re-engage our audience of medics, PAs, and docs who have so much going on. Anything I could do for you folks is, is work that's really, really important. So, One of, uh, one of your initial slogans or mantras was upstairs care, upstairs care, downstairs, which was quite catchy. Why did you change that to maximally aggressive care always or everywhere? Yeah, so some, some of the people uh, very astutely pointed out that sometimes there's not ideal care upstairs. And to put the ICU on a pedestal and say that their care is perfect and everything that happens out of hospital or in the ED is, is not, well, that wasn't really the message we wanted to get across. So uh, maximally aggressive care for all providers, for all patients. And that's maximally aggressive curative care when that's the right way to go, but maximally aggressive palliative care when we can't save a life, at least we could take away pain. Well, we really want to impress upon our medics that they're capable of providing that higher level and higher quality of care wherever they are. Um, how do you convey this to uh, residents or fellows who are spending time in your uh, emergency department with you? Uh, I try to lead by example. I, I don't know any other way to do it. Uh, all, all the lectures in the world are not better than them seeing how you, if you could own your resuscitations, you could know how every single item in that room works, how everything that's going on with the patient is being observed and watched and, and used to figure out your next uh, plan of care, then, then they're going to model that. And all of the words in the world don't, don't convey as much as action. Oh, that's absolutely true in our world as well. Um, this, military medics, even in, in the conventional military, are beginning to carry ketamine in their aid bags over traditional opiate analgesia such as morphine for the purpose of analgesia and combat casualties. Some have uh, nasal atomizers in order to administer it internasally. Others go right to the uh, IM injections before they have an IV or an IO line in place, you know, depending on the situation. What would you tell some of these medics who may carry that, the drug but rarely have an opportunity to push it like you do in your hospital on a daily basis? Sure. So. We have experience with IM uh, for patients that we just can't get an IV and they're just freaking out. And that's really the, the time we'll go IM. And the dose is markedly increased from our normal dose. In, in general, we'll be given a patient who is um, 
just really in the throes of a psychotic episode and needs immediate calming, uh, we'd give them a milligram per kilogram IV. But if you're going to give IM, it, we increase that dose four or five fold. So they get four or 500 milligrams or uh, some, something, basically the extent of the amount in the vials we actually use for these IM doses, because we have a, a concentrated form um, to give IM so that the, the volume is not as high. And then the IV form we have is a little bit more dilute. So we just basically give the whole vial. And uh, the take home from that is you really can't overdose on this medication, or at least we clinically can't find a, a amount of drug that really is going to cause problems. So if you need immediate control of a situation, someone's freaking out, they have blood in their airway, you're thinking this might be a cricotherotomy, but the patient's just not standing, still not letting it happen, and you don't have IV access, then uh, giving a uh, big dose of IM ketamine may be what allows you to temporize that situation. Okay, I appreciate that. I think that's what we're telling our guys to go ahead and like you said, temporize the situation and then move on, get your other IV access and then uh, do your other interventions that you need to. Absolutely. So since the 1980s, pharmacology and anesthesia textbooks have been saying the same things about ketamine, that it causes hypertension, increased ICP, interocular pressure, cardiac depression, and the patient's head will explode basically. And that is after they go crazy and kill the staff, of course. Why are we just now saying all of these things are wrong and can we trust this new data over what we've been taught in the past? Yeah, it's so funny. Uh, there was this prejudice against this drug in the anesthesia community and pretty much everything in emergency medicine for induction and, and agents uh, that were being used for these purposes all came from the anesthesia world. And I'm not sure why it got such a bad rap. Um, I think some of the early... Users of it really didn't understand the unique nature of this drug, that it's not a sedative. In fact, it's, it's really in some ways the opposite of a sedative. It's a dissociative. And it's not the nice, clean thing you'd want in an operating room for an elective patient coming in to get their knee scoped. And it probably led to some people uh, looking at it like it was a problem. But they just didn't understand the drug. Uh, but when you went out of the first world to anywhere in the third world, um, they adopted this instantly. And for doctors without borders and anyone without uh, a, a backup of multiple physicians to care for a sick patient, this was the drug of choice. And there's an enormous body of literature from those uses in minimally monitored circumstances, austere environments with basically in the adult world, nary a problem. I mean, you really have to go looking for a problem with this drug that's meaningful. Now, there is one problem we all know about. Um, it's the one frequently spoken about. It's the emergence reaction. And it that just never mattered to me that much. Uh, that didn't, compared to the other things like causing massive hypotension with drugs like propofol or histamine release from drugs like morphine, uh, the, the dirtiness of an emergence reaction just didn't really rate very high. And if you know how to deal with it and you know how to prevent it, and we'll talk about both of those things in just a bit, then really it's, it's a negligible uh, risk profile compared to all the other kind of drugs that bring so many disadvantages. Ketamine, uh, okay, we'll deal with the emergency reaction. Besides that, not too much. Now, you mentioned a few things, Paul. You mentioned hypertension. It can cause that. Uh, definitely, because it has indirect sympathetic release. So it's basically releasing the patient's endogenous catecholamines. Most of the patients in your world are already going to be thrumming with catechols. Uh, there's probably going to be very little, if any, effect on their blood pressure. You take a totally normal patient, their shoulder may be out. Uh, yeah, maybe they'll get a hypertensive, but you take someone in, uh, in combat and you give them ketamine, I would... Be, I'd be surprised if you're going to see much incidence of massive hypertension. And even if you do, by virtue of your environment, these people have very good cardiovascular systems at baseline. These are not people with extensive cardiac history and multiple valve replacements. And, uh, you know, they're not 60 years old with an ischemic heart. So I, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even care in the least about any vital sign changes uh, from the ketamine. So let's get rid of that. You mentioned ICP. That was just a pure myth. Um, they, they conflated a few things. If you take a patient with already elevated ICP and elevated blood pressure and you give them ketamine and their blood pressure rises further, okay, that might be a problem. Be but that's not because of the ketamine. That's because the blood pressure went up. Uh, other than that, there's really no evidence of any deleterious effects on brain injury patients or ICP. And in fact, there's emerging literature that it may be neuroprotective. So it, I think it's a very good thing for anyone 
with traumatic brain injury or the possibility of traumatic brain injury, so long as you don't have a pressure that's already through the roof. Okay. Yeah. We're actually putting together a new, uh, I guess, CPG or clinical practice guideline just for uh, traumatic brain injury and ICP. And we're really going to be uh, recommending that ketamine is one of the possible agents that we can use. So we just want to keep hitting this so that medics aren't afraid to use it. But you did touch on one thing and, uh, that is with uh, morphine. So what would you say to your fellow physicians? Some of them are medical directors and unit medical officers who are not yet sold on medics using ketamine for analgesia and are stuck on issuing things like morphine. You know, it, it's not an either or. I mean, every drug that's currently out there has a role and I could figure out uses for them. But if I had to pick one, it certainly would be ketamine over morphine. Um, and morphine already is kind of a dirty drug. It, it does have the histamine release that the synthetic opioids like fentanyl and hydromorphone don't have. Um, and, you know, it doesn't bring that much to the table. That being said, uh, morphine's a great drug. And if you gave me a choice of two, I'd take them both. Uh, if you gave me a choice of one, though, ketamine is the, is the Swiss Army knife. I mean, ketamine has so many purposes that to issue it just opens up a range of things you just can't do otherwise. You can't, you can't sedate a patient with morphine. You could relieve their pain. You can't sedate them. You can't intubate a patient with morphine. You can't um, take a profoundly hypotensive patient and think it's a good idea to give morphine. So um, if you have two, great. But if you don't, ketamine's the one. Yeah, just like uh, Ruben Strayer's talk said, he went through all the the possible uses for it and how they're looking at it for uh, possibly treating depression or suicidal ideology and everything else. So it, it almost seems like it is becoming a, a wonder drug. And lately on FOMED, ketamine seems, you know, that, that it is the miracle drug that it can be used for anything and everything. Is there a scenario I could expect to see in the field um, that, you know, ketamine for analgesia and dissociation would be a bad choice? I don't think so. And this is a just extrapolation, Paul. So you have to be wary. This is not truly evidence-based yet. But if I take a lot of the evidence I have seen in the particular environment we're talking about, there may be some prevention of PTSD from this medication. And again, that's not locked in. But uh, I feel that if you're going to get a sedative agent, something like this that at least has the potential to alter for the better um, any negative memories, uh, this may also eventually find a role there. So it's particularly good. Uh, you had mentioned, is there any downside in any circumstance to the analgesic dose of ketamine, which my friend Ruben, who you might have uh, hopefully listened to the lecture by now, anyone? Oh yeah, a couple yep. times. Oh no, I know you have, Paul. I'm saying uh, any of the listeners who are tuning into this, um, hopefully you've listened to Ruben's lecture as Paul had asked you to at the beginning. If you didn't, you're, you're missing out because it really does put things on a really good spectrum. But uh, he calls this analgesic dose range uh, from 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. And that, that's been my experience as well. I'll usually stay 0.1 to 0.2. Uh, milligrams per kilogram for an analgesic dose, or if we're if we're just going to stop pretending, you know, we're just going to give pretty much everyone between seven and fifteen milligrams. Uh, we rarely even bother figuring out the kilogram stuff in most of our adults, but somewhere in that range, uh, you might be just veering into getting a little bit of the recreational fun of ketamine, but that's a bonus in in most of my patients, at least. Uh, I've yet to find a patient unhappy with the analgesic dose, except for one thing. Some patients become dizzy. Um, it's, it's easily, you know, you could talk them through it. They're like, I'm dizzy. I'm like, I know, that's from the medication, but it has your pain, and they're like, the pain's better. And then they're fine, but there definitely can be some degree of vertigo from this. Okay, with that vertigo, do you ever pre-treat for nausea or, you know, just in case there's going to be some vomiting, do you ever uh, give any drugs for that, some Phenergan or, uh, you know, Zofran or anything else? So in general, uh, the the induction of nausea, I found at the higher doses in my experience, uh, these people are not that like entire room, you know, yanking around and they're starting to vomit like they do sometimes when they emerge from a dissociation. So in general, at the analgesic dose, I wouldn't bother. Um, but certainly we could talk as we get to the higher doses that that may be an option. And if you just wanted to empirically give a patient some kind of anti-nausea medicine, I don't think there'd be any downside to that. Okay. Have any of your patients ever had any like really adverse reaction that made you change the way that you did anything pertaining to uh, ketamine administration? Yeah. So such a good question. Well, first of all, I've, I've only seen two emergence uh, reactions my entire career. And that, that spans now, I think, 13 years. Um, one of them, 
uh, we knew exactly why it happened. We, we, we like to talk our patients down before we dissociate them with ketamine. We tell them what's going to happen. It's going to be like an acid trip. You might have heard about your dad talking about this, and you know it's going to be an amazing experience. Some people even say it's a spiritual awakening. People pay lots of money for this medication, so you're getting it for free. It's going to be a good ride. But what you think about, what you are having on your head at the time you go down is probably going to alter and shape your dreams. And we tell them all this, and it, it works out usually pretty well because now they're like, I have some control. When you look at the old acid literature, that was what uh, people's fear was, is that when they were felt like they were lucidly in the acid trip, then they were okay with it. But when they felt like the acid trip was controlling them, that's led to a bad trip. So we told him, this guy all this, and then just as we were settling him down, the orthopod got all antsy and yanked his dislocated ankle before he had fully dissociated. So he was in the middle of that partial dissociation period where the world still has effect on your brain and the things you're seeing, but you filter it through kind of a miasma of bad dreams. And so just as he's about to dissociate, he had the worst pain of his life, and he woke up and thought he was a wolf, and he got on all fours and started baying at the ceiling. Uh, we gave him two milligrams of midazolam, and he immediately stopped, and he was fine. So that that was the most dramatic one. The second one was just someone saying, I never want to see anything like that again. Please, please make it, make it stop, make it stop. And we gave him some midazolam, and he was fine. Those are the only two emergency reactions. Never had apnea. Um, that's almost, uh, well, actually, um, it's not almost. It's case reportable. There's been one case of apnea, extended apnea. You get five, 10 seconds of it if you push it quickly in, in any patient. I've seen that a bunch. So you should be aware of that and know that it's going to disappear. There's one case report in the adult literature on apnea that was prolonged and actually required a patient being bagged. Um, I've yet to see it, and that's you know makes total sense. Being there, there's only been one in all of the medical literature I could find. I'm sure there's been more. You know, people don't report everything, but it's incredibly rare uh, that people talk about adult laryngospasm. I've never seen this. I've seen things where the patient looks like they're you know kind of bucking against their own airway, and then I do a head tilt chin lift, and what had happened was that their soft tissues of their you know, glottic structures had fallen backwards, which is what happens anytime you sedate a patient. They need to be properly positioned, especially someone who may have some predisposition to sleep apnea. But on all my patients, when I repositioned them, that sound went away. So I've never seen this adult laryngospasm. There's also been maybe two or three case reports of that. So again, insanely rare. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, that, that's all of the adverse events I can name. We did mention, though, the, uh, that some patients, when they awake, not during their dissociation, but when they awake, can very often puke. Okay. And would you pretreat for that, or is it just you let it happen because it's already happening? Well, if you have a patient who, let's say you gave a dissociative dose because you had to put back in their hip or their shoulder or something like that, so they went to sleep healthy and they're going to wake up healthy. Um, for those guys, sure, I'll pre-treat. Why not? Um, now, on the other hand, if you're given the med for someone you're going to intubate or put in a surgical airway, well, then there's not really too much reason. Um, you know, we'll usually put down a gastric tube on those folks. Do you guys, are in the prolonged field, are you guys carrying gastric tubes? Uh, yes, we are. Even our uh, our SACA medics are doing gastric tubes, and they get to practice on each other, so that's always a fun day <laughs> for them. There you go. No IRB <laughs> in the military. I love it. Um so yeah, definitely. If you place the gastric tube in there, they have an airway, then I wouldn't bother with the with the pre nausea. Okay. Okay. Since we're coming up on the twenty minute mark, I'm going to go ahead and cut this episode off here. Uh, we got another twenty minutes for uh, part two, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>